One of the top advisors for former President Trump's re-election campaign is reportedly listed as a key figure in special counsel Jack Smith's indictment against Trump in the classified documents case. ABC News first reported that Susie Wiles, as the person mentioned in the indictment, who was present during a 2021 Bedminster meeting when Trump displayed a classified map. The New York Post goes on to reveal that Wiles also has a top post at a lobbying firm serving Chinese entities that potentially pose a threat to national security. So joining us now, state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, Dave Ehrenberg. Dave, great to see you again. So let's get your reaction here. First to the news that this grand jury in Miami still going on the on the classified documents case. More subpoenas being issued, it had been reported. And now that Susie Wiles, a pretty prominent person in Republican politics, uh, is, is in this dilemma where she has been identified as someone who was there when Trump pulled out that classified document. Yeah, Jonathan, the new subpoenas from the grand jury in South Florida shows that Jack Smith is not done. Who could have figured that Trump's personal attacks against Jack Smith and his family would have no effect on him. Well, the investigation moves forward, and the fact that Susie Wiles is caught in it is a big deal because Susie Wiles is one of Trump's top campaign officials. She ran his campaign in Florida in 2016 and in 2020. She's one of his top national people, and you could have the specter of Trump's top political consultant testifying against him in a courtroom. Uh, you know, I don't think she'll be charged with a crime unless she lied to investigators, but this is a script that would be too preposterous for any TV show. And somewhere, Ron DeSantis is laughing because Susie Wiles went to work for Ron DeSantis and they had a falling out. And so there's some bl bad blood between them. So now she's back working for Trump, DeSantis's biggest rival, and here we are. Well, here we are. And what, what I'm curious about is, is Dave, uh, we, we have these these happening and two of the most vivid examples as the Washington Post says of Donald Trump abusing uh, abusing uh, his access to classified documents happened actually in New Jersey. I'm curious uh, why isn't there a grand jury in New Jersey since that's where the actions happened or can you have the the grand jury in uh, in, in Miami and then based on what the grand jury finds in Miami bring a case in New Jersey. Joe, if they're going to bring a case to New Jersey, they're going to impanel a grand jury up there. And look, the, this Department of Justice is good at keeping secrets. We didn't know about the South Florida grand jury until a short time before the indictments down there. So we don't know that there's no grand jury up in New Jersey. We know there's been one in Washington, D.C. So I think of this as an insurance policy for Jack Smith and Merrick Garland. If Judge Cannon does things that they really don't like that are far outside the law, they could go ahead and get another venue. They could seek an indictment in D.C. where the public there voted for Trump with 5 percent of the vote, uh, a very blue area. Or they can go up to New Jersey and do it up there. So there are some safety valves in case Judge Cannon gives the Department of Justice such a hard time. And already it looks like there are so many delays that the Trump people are trying to happen because that's their, their strategy, delay, delay, delay. One of them is Walt Nada, the co-defendant, still hasn't found found a local right. attorney and still hasn't had his arraignment. That's ridiculous. Say, let me ask you really quickly, Dave and Pat, as, 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 as we move on. Why, um, why didn't he charge Donald Trump uh, in, in the Florida case? Why didn't he charge him with, with showing these documents? Well, it's a good point. Trump is being charged under the Espionage Act for the willful retention of the documents. There's another part of the Espionage Act that involves the dissemination. But the dissemination apparently occurred in New Jersey at Bedminster. That's why he has not right. been charged of it. But that could come. Well, and that's and, why Susie and, Wiles and, and is a crucial way, part though, of it. That, Dave, that's more serious, though, right? I mean, the dissemination is actually the most serious part of it. So, again, if you're Donald Trump, you've got to be thinking— wait, this guy's not going to let me walk on the most serious charges. Like, he hasn't charged Donald Trump yet for the worst things that he did, if you look at the law. 
in a court of public opinion, Joe, I agree with you. Dissemination is worse in many ways than the willful retention because you're showing our secrets to people who are unauthorized to it. But it's actually the same penalty under the Espionage Act. It's all still up to 10 years in prison, and they already have charges against them under that act. But also, you need to prove it. You need to have the witness there, witnesses there, maybe a Susie Weil, say, yeah, I saw it. He showed it to me. And also, Trump's defense now is, oh, it was just bluster. I didn't show anything. Remember that? I, he said, uh, maybe they're just golf uh, course information, or it could even be crossword puzzles. Wow. Now, that's my explanation for it. I, I think in the end, they may bring those charges, and it would be a Real blow to Donald Trump and his attempt to say, oh, this didn't amount to anything. I didn't put anyone at risk. Well, that's why Susie Wilds, as you were saying, why Susie Wilds' testimony is so important. The conservative political network led by billionaire Charles Koch has raised more than $70 million ahead of the 2024 election in a push to sink Donald Trump. According to the New York Times, the network plans to throw its weight into the Republican presidential nominating contest for the first time in its nearly 20-year history. The Times notes the Koch Network's goal, described only indirectly in written internal communications, is to stop Donald Trump from winning the Republican nomination. Back in February, a top political official in the network wrote a memo to donors and activists saying, it is time to, quote, have a president in 2025 who represents a new chapter. So obviously the Koch network has been incredibly influential, John, over the years in Republican politics, pushing a bunch of money into elections they say they think can help to sink Donald Trump. Unclear what that means, which presidential candidate it's focused on or backing, or if this is just throwing money away because Donald Trump is running away with this thing. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know yet here, Willie. You're right, the Koch Network, extraordinarily influential in conservative politics, though influence diminished a bit of late in recent years. Uh, they've been opposed to Trump uh, for some time, uh, and he's given it right back. And he also is less reliant on some of the big donors because he has proven so successful at those small donations of raising money from his loyal followers, uh, including getting them to pay for his legal defense fee uh, more than one occasion. So we'll see here, though, that's still a big number, and it does symbolize the, the somehow some, I stress some, Republican-leaning institutions are really trying to move the party away from Trump uh, you know, because they just simply, largely because of electability reasons, they don't think he can win again in 2024. But right now, the anti-Trump movement hasn't really taken off. And it's not clear if they coalesce around one of his rivals and who that might be. Ron DeSantis was certainly the great hope uh, among many Republicans who wanted to find a different path away from Trump. And at least so far, his campaign has not achieved liftoff. He's 30 odd points behind Trump in the polls. And yes, it's early, but there's already a sense, Willie, I'll certainly say this, Republicans I speak to here in D.C. and across the country, a sense of real panic among the never Trump Republicans that they feel like the party is already hurtling uh, toward nominating him yet again. In large part because the, the Ron D. Santis train has taken a detour away from winning. Uh, he said just had a horrible, horrible few months. So let's let, let's let's look at this, uh, John Heilman. Um, when you have the Coke Network talking about uh, pushing seventy million dollars in the Stop Trump effort, uh, reporters uh, talking about how uh, Leonard Leo, uh, who you know just. Uh, uh, inherited a, over a billion dollars for his political activities, is uh, starting to spread money out behind Ron DeSantis. Uh, it seems people with the most money uh, in the Republican Party are uniting against Trump in a way they didn't do in 16. Uh, you know, they, they didn't and they didn't, they didn't, Joe. So you remember back in 2016, at least a lot of the people with the most money uh, were united behind uh, Jeb Jeb Bush, not maybe not. Uh, we'll see how it all plays out in this in this race. I mean, it, it's it's been this growing trend as we've observed over the course of the last few months. The the the, the Republican donor class uh, from the from the the, the circles of uh, who all listen to people like Karl Rove, um, the people who are in the club for growth, the people now in, you know out front. We've known the Cokes have been kind of moving this direction for some number of months. They've all now kind of decided that they are definitely, definitely, definitely gonna gonna try to challenge Trump. I think the problem is twofold. One is that you know who with whom. You know, uh, you, you talked about Ron DeSantis having his detour. Uh, you know, you can't beat Donald Trump with money. 
you got to beat Donald Trump with a candidate and a candidate, a well-financed candidate. Money's part of the problem, it's part of the solution here. But you can't win. You can't beat Donald Trump without a candidate. And the problem right now, at least, is there everybody and their mothers running their in the Republican nomination contest, a split field. Now helps Donald Trump and the arguments. The second point I want to make. The second point is that the argument that the establishment forces uh, on both the, in the deep state on the left and now increasingly in what, what what Donald Trump will surely attack as the establishment right are a raid against Donald Trump. It actually helps him or his argument to his core followers, which is still a the largest chunk, the plurality chunk of the Republican base. It helps them with the argument that he's a persecuted figure, that he's a martyr, uh, and that he's fighting for the little guy like them who are all under siege from all these various powerful forces. So it's it's not that that, that uh, if, if Donald Trump's going to get beaten, he's going to get beaten by someone with a bunch of money. But uh, this this is not in any way uh, a thing that guarantees that Donald Trump is going to go down just because now suddenly the, the Kochs and others have decided that it, that it's in their best interest and in that, that, that a more electable candidate could win. In, in certain respects, it could actually end up helping Trump and, and, uh, and hurting the Republican Party. A new immigration bill in Florida is set to go into effect tomorrow. It centers around migrant workers who make up a large portion of the workforce in the state's key industries. Morning Joe reporter Daniela Pierre Bravo traveled to Florida to investigate how the new law will affect the agriculture industry. Of course, one of the state's top economic drivers. And Daniela joins us now. Good morning, Daniela. What did you learn? Hey, Willie, good morning. Well, first, that the effects of the bill have already started. Immigrants without status are leaving the state and have left the state in fear of the new law. Second, the implications of these immigrants leaving could extend beyond just individual cases. It could bring larger economic and labor concerns. Here we grow spinach, chili, a little bit of everything. 22-year-old Flor came to the U.S. from Guatemala three years ago, and on any given day, she's joined by other workers at this farm in Homestead, Florida. But today, she's doing the job all on her own. There were seven of us. The truth is, the other seven already left. They already left to other states. Flor's colleagues have abandoned their life in Florida in fear of Governor DeSantis's new Senate Bill 1718, which will bring sweeping changes to Florida's immigration law when it takes effect on July 1st. We are acting uh, with the strongest measures yet. We're proud of the legislature for stepping up and for getting this, uh, getting this done. Among other provisions, it requires public and now private employers with 25 or more employees to use a federal e-verify system to confirm workers' immigration status imposing strict penalties on employers who hire workers without status and criminalizing transporting undocumented immigrants across state lines. In the pandemic, these workers were important. They were vital. And now they're being repaid by this slight from Governor Ron DeSantis. They're in panic. The news felt like an impact, a hurricane, like a tornado warning coming towards them. Flor is one of the estimated 772,000 undocumented people living in Florida, a state that's home to the third largest share of agricultural undocumented workers in the country. Within the agriculture industry in particular, we know there's at least 130,000 seasonal and migrant farm workers who come here to work. Now, we know at least 60,000 of those workers are undocumented, but likely that is a conservative estimate. Juan says that he's already seen empty farms and workers leave the state. I've seen it in Homestead, I've seen it in Palm Beach, and in Tampa. Agriculture is often thought of as almost the employment of last resort, uh, for, particularly for native or, or documented workers. Given the situation in Florida right now, and really nationwide, with a low unemployment rate, it's going to be even harder to convince people that these are jobs worth taking. Ermila is one of those owners having a hard time finding workers. She's had experience working with undocumented immigrants and worries of fear around the bill will drive even more workers away. They're the ones with the experience. They're the ones who can tolerate the heat. Workers with legal documents look for work in offices and restaurants. Many workers have already left and many of them still have planned to leave. It's not going to be easy. If they're leaving because of fear, it's not going to be easy to find more workers. If it's harder to find workers, business will go down. What happens, especially for those seasonal workers that aren't set to come back until September and October? It's likely that those workers 
you know, they simply skip Florida entirely on, on their sort of path. And when you have parts of that supply chain missing or parts of that production process missing, it becomes that much harder for the people who are left do their job. And so you're going to see further exits from agricultural work, regardless of whether or not someone has a documented status or not. So what about the long-term consequences? A lot of the crops that they produce can also be produced in other states that are not going to maybe have these same labor problems. If this sticks around and workers respond to it, which we have evidence to say that they will, it's going to likely change the geography of agricultural production, particularly for those crops that Florida is known for. What Governor DeSantis has done is dehumanized immigration, and he's made visible a serious problem, an underground world that already exists in Florida and the rest of the United States. I asked Flor if she has plans to stay or leave Florida. I'm not planning on leaving. I have my boy here. I have a son who was born here. I have a life here. Leaving for another state is like starting from zero. I reached out to the governor's office for a response on addressing specifically economic concerns and labor shortage worries that we've been hearing from farm owners. Their press secretary reiterated that this bill addresses only illegal immigration, as they chose to word it, and that the bill is a solution to companies hiring them instead of Floridians. But experts tell me, Willie, really, that workers without status make up around 40 percent or more of the agriculture industry in Florida, many of whom work at more than one farm year-round, right? So we'll have to see and see if migrant workforce continues to shrink and what impact that might have um, for prices on consumers. Willie? All right, we'll keep a close eye on this story. Thanks for bringing it to us. Morning Joe reporter Daniela Pierre Bravo. Daniela, thanks so much. Biden in Chicago on Wednesday touting, he says, the success of Bidenomics, its impact across the country, including in the state of Maryland, where private companies so far have announced investments totaling $1 billion. Meanwhile, in the public sector, Maryland is experiencing a surge of investments in the state's infrastructure. And joining us now to talk about those investments and much more, Democratic Governor Wes Moore. He's also a member of the Biden-Harris 2024 Campaign National Advisory Board. Governor, it is great to see you again. Uh, talk us through, if you can, what's great happening you. in your state, in Maryland. We're looking at all of these data points, historically low unemployment nationally, inflation beginning to tick down, and now you have the President of the United United States going out and saying, hey, things are getting better out here. And yet when you look at the way the country feels about Biden's handling of the economy, those numbers are very low. So let's bring it down to the state level. How are things looking there? Yeah, it's, it's important that people understand that that progress is not inevitable and that it happens because we're intentional and we're deliberate about what we're investing in. And the things that we're seeing here in the state of Maryland in partnership with the Biden administration is that we're investing in the things that work and the things where you're investing in the future, you're actually producing the results for now. So, for example, you know, we're investing in, in mass transit and infrastructure, where just in our first weeks, we're able to stand with the president in Maryland uh, to announce uh, an investment in the Frederick Douglass Tunnel that's going to produce 30,000 jobs in the state of Maryland. We announced that we're putting the Red Line project back on track, which is a east-west transit that's going to connect people to opportunity in the Baltimore region. That we just uh, received a grant from the federal government for $267 million because I made a pledge to the, pe to the people of my state that by the end of my terms, I want to make sure that we are fully wired in terms of internet access and Wi-Fi. And this investment by the federal government is going to make that happen. And so we're investing in infrastructure. We're investing in people by job retraining and job reskilling. Just yesterday, I was with uh, the, the president's senior advisor for climate change, Ali Zaidi, in Baltimore for a retrofitting, a home retrofitting project that we're investing in together and in giving individuals a pathway to work wages and wealth and making sure we're reducing barriers for businesses, for them to be able to grow and thrive and making our state more competitive. So the numbers don't lie. We're seeing a measure of economic growth that's happening in the state of Maryland. Three straight months of record low unemployment in the state of Maryland. But it's because we're moving in partnership with the federal government and with the Biden administration to make sure that we're being deliberate and intentional about making those results stick. 
So, Governor, good morning. Uh, you just went through uh, the progress morning. being shown there in your state and, and certainly uh, a lot of uh, positive numbers economically, na nationally as well. But poll after poll suggests that voters still don't feel great about the economy, that they feel like something's, something's off. They, they real have real worries. And also polls suggest, including one by Gallup just a few days ago, that they trust Republicans on the economy more than Democrats. What do you make of that? And what can your party do to turn around those numbers? Well, for people who express frustration, uh, I, I think we have to acknowledge that frustration is real. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's underscored by, I think, a lot of not just historic but present challenges that we've had in the economy. We can't forget about what we just come out of. We can't forget about not just the economic but the psychological damage that has happened to the average worker. I see it in Maryland every single day, going from western Maryland to the eastern shore, from northeast Maryland to southern Maryland, everywhere in between. So it is real, and we have to acknowledge it. The thing that I would also say is when people are looking at how we're moving here in the state of Maryland and moving in partnership with the Biden administration. We're producing results, that the plan that we have is actually making sure we're focusing on job retraining and job reskilling, knowing that we have some of the best four institutions in America here in the state of Maryland, but not every one of our students need to attend one. And we're going to focus on things like creating pathways for them to enter into a workforce, that Maryland is the first state in the country now to offer a service year option for our high school graduates, to give them an opportunity to have both experiential learning and knowing that this gives a financial cushion for them as they're entering out of high school knowing that we can do things like build up and actually invest in neighborhoods and invest in communities in a way that's helping to address public safety. And what we're seeing, frankly, from the other side oftentimes is not a plan. It's just simply a playbook. And the playbook is to tell people how bad things are and then to tell people that you're the only ones that can solve it. What we're seeing right now is actually a plan that's being delivered and is having real results. Governor Al Sharpton, uh, I, I want to ask you Good at this you, point, uh, you, you're the only uh, black governor in the, in the country. Uh, I, I would be very interested in knowing your reaction to the Supreme Court decision yesterday on affirmative action, particularly since I know your background of having worked with a lot of young people and, and, and tried to gear them toward getting a higher education. You and I have worked together before you were governor in some That's of those right. areas, so I know firsthand your sensitivity there. I also want uh, to uh, put in uh, my question, uh, as governor, as you bring in all of this infrastructure money and others that the Biden-Harris administration has gotten through, you also wanted to have a fair amount of black and brown businesses be able to have access to contracts. Does this ruling That's right. that race is unconstitutional chill some of those efforts in fear that you might the state might get sued if they have a certain target and therefore uh, has to back up, even though they did nothing to legacy uh, 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 people that had affirmative <laughs> legacy uh, uh, advances in education. It seems that th th they've done a devastating blow. I'd be interested in your reaction to both of those questions. Thanks, Rev. And, and, and you're right. I mean, this decision is not surprising by any stretch of the imagination when you know this court. I mean, elections have consequences. Uh, but the thing that we know, even though it's not surprising, it's still deeply frustrating and maddening. Uh, the fact that, that the Supreme Court, I mean, the Constitution is supposed to be a living document that, that, that continues to grow to open up opportunity for people. Right. That, that uses the Constitution and legal basis to be able to see more people and to live up to the to the inherent values of this country. And we're watching how this court is using it as a document to restrict, using it as a document to pull back. And, and this decision is is no different. And the thing that I know is, you know, I have spent uh, not just the past 24 hours, but even before them, because we anticipated that this court would make this decision, speaking with leaders in higher education all throughout the state of Maryland. And we stand united in saying that we believe that our institutions of higher education should be important and representative mosaics of our society. And that if you really want to use them for what they're for, which is preparing people for the world that they will inherit, 
It means making sure that your campus exemplifies and demonstrates the beautiful diversity of the environment that they are going to walk into once they leave that campus. So we, we are, we are com committed to it. We also know that we are already working to make sure that this will not have any forms of chilling impacts on the progress that we are already making in terms of making sure that there is minority business participation, women business participation, and veteran business participation in the economic growth and the economic engine that's happening right now in the state of Maryland. And as Rev mentioned, Governor Moore spent his career before he was elected governor in poverty fighting and in education, so he knows of what he speaks. Democratic Governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, always great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Happy Fourth to you and your family. And scorching temperatures and bad air quality are really impacting millions of Americans outside of Chicago and the East Coast all across the country. Texas, my Lord, Texas has been baking under a severe early season heat wave. It's reaching triple digits this week. Temperatures there are rivaling the hottest locations on the planet, including the Sahara Desert and parts of the Persian Gulf. The heat is now spreading to the lower Mississippi Valley and parts of the Southwest. Meanwhile, much of the Midwest and Northeast are facing unhealthy air alerts this morning as wildfire smoke from Canada blankets the region there. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Vin Gupta, to talk about what all of this means. He's a Harvard-trained lung specialist and health policy expert. Hey, uh, doctor, we'll get, to the, um, we'll get to the heat in a minute. Just horrible, horrible temperatures, especially in Texas. But first, let's talk about the smoke coming down from Canada. How dangerous is it? Well, Joe, good morning. Thank you for highlighting this. It, it, this is something that I don't, we haven't had to talk about outside the West Coast of the United States but in the months of July and August. The, the fact that the Midwest, New York, just a few weeks ago is experiencing this is bringing to light something critical here. Air pollution, Joe, in and of itself, is now the sixth leading cause of death worldwide. And we don't talk about this a lot, but the impact it can have on maternal health. We know that if, if Pregnant women just breathe in air from wildfire smoke for just a few days. It can result in preterm birth. We know children exposed to wildfire smoke, again, for just a few days, might have lower lung volumes for the next 10 years of their life, reduced immune system. So this is serious. And there are clear things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. But we are living in this era of wildfire smoke. We have to be prepared. A far more common occurrence, not just in the weeks ahead this summer, uh, but as summer is going forward because of the effects of climate change, the more the greater frequency of these wildfires, and so on. So, how can we, as a country, prepare to adjust to do this? What can we do in the short term uh, to take better care of ourselves to protect our lungs? But what are some things we need to do longer range to, to for people, particularly people with vulnerabilities, if this is the new reality? Jonathan, I'm so glad you asked that. And, and I think we have a, a graphic here just for, for the viewers so that I'd love to take them through. There are, there are certainly things that you can do to keep yourself safe. First of all, go to airnow.gov, airnow.gov to check your local air quality report. Yes, it might seem hazy outside, but Jonathan, the fact is you spend most of your time, most of your life indoors. If it's hazy outside, you want to make sure that your indoor air quality is as clean as possible, so stay informed. If it's bad outside, it's likely risky to be bad inside. Avoid physical exertion. You can tell me how many people still go out and runs when it's hazy outside. That's a bad thing to do, even if you are otherwise healthy. Clean your indoor air. You want to make sure that if you have an AC, as an example, look and see what type of filter you have in that. Make sure, one, it's clean. You're cleaning it regularly. If you can, Order a MERV 10 or MERV 13 filter. It's actually going to catch the particles from the wildfire smoke much more effectively than the filters that are usually in place. That's vital. That's one of the most important things you can do. MERV 13 filters. Run your AC as, a, as an additional point. If you have AC, I know a lot of people don't have AC, but if you have AC, make sure the inset to the fresh air intake is shut off. You're setting it to recirculate. Again, that MERV 13 filter, keep your windows closed. If you have asthma, COPD, one of these underlying health conditions, make sure you're optimized with your medical regimen, that you're feeling well, you have refills to your inhalers, so you're as optimized as possible. And then lastly, those masks we talked so much about the last three and a half years, use them. N95s don't protect you fully, but they're better than nothing. 
Dr. Gupta, good morning. It's good to see you. I want to turn you to that heat in Texas. The people in Texas are used to the summertime being hot, but this is something else. Heat over 110 degrees, rivaling the temperatures in the Sahara Desert and the Persian Gulf right now, making Texas among the hottest places on Earth right now. Uh, the risks are obvious, but this has been going on. This is sustained now for a long time. What do the people down there do about it? How do they cope? Yeah, this is difficult. Again, a lot of these places have grid problems. If you have AC, you have to utilize it. If you don't, there are shelters that are being put into place across these places in the Southwest that are experiencing high heat. Just real quick, I know we don't have a ton of time. A lot of heat. It's not just heat stroke. There's cardiovascular compromise. We've seen now heat actually impact, again, maternal health, result in preterm birth. And there's now clear evidence here that excessive heat leads to premature aging. There's a lot of ways in which heat is causing ill human health, Willie, in ways that we don't often talk about. So critical to protect yourself and get shelter publicly or if you have it at home. Yeah, we want our friends down there to be safe and certainly check on your neighbors as well. NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Vin Gupta. Dr. Gupta, always great to have you on. Thanks so much.